kick off this episode of hypothetically speaking with this clip of jim jordan in congress i think the ranking member sitting to his left is steve scalise i believe and he has a number of uh very high ranking professional medical people uh testifying in front of him including dr Mueller, uh admiral gerard and uh, you'll see that as we go on here so let me cut over to this clip and let's kick this off and let's see what uh, what we can learn from this together. Friday, January 31st, 2020 at 1032 p.m., Dr. Fauci gets an email from Christian Anderson. Christian Anderson's a British researcher who's received numerous grants from NIH. Two really important sentences are in that email. Two sentences that get Dr. Fauci's attention. The first is this. The unusual features of the virus make up a really small part of the genome. So one has to look really closely at all the sequences to see that some of the features look engineered. Again, this is January 31st, 2020. Second sentence. Eddie, Bob, Mike, and myself all find the genome inconsistent with expectations from evolutionary theory. Email arrives 1032 to Dr. Fauci on January 31st, 2020. Two hours later, two hours later at 1229 in the morning, Dr. Fauci sends an email to his top deputy, Mr. Hugh Oshenkloss. Guy has worked for Fauci for 15 years, part of his inner circle. Sends it, subject line says, important in all capital letters. The, he attaches a paper on gain of function research written by Dr. Barrick and Dr. Xi. Dr. Xi, of course, is the so-called bat lady, bat woman, the lady who does research in the Wuhan China lab. This email, Dr. Fauci says, again, to his top deputy, it is essential that we speak this AM. Keep your cell phone on, read this paper. You will have tasks to do today that must be done. Notice the intensity. Notice the focus. I mean, this is the house is on fire email here. Now, two hours after that, at 2.48 in the morning, Dr. Fauci's busy this morning, 12.29, that email he sent to Dr. Auschenkloss, his top deputy, two hours later at 2.48 in the morning, he sends another email, this one to Robert Cadlick, assistant HHS secretary, Trump appointee, not part of his inner circle, and he attaches a different article to this email, one that says the virus came from an animal that downplays any lab leak theory. Now, again... Notice the tone of this one. Bob, this just came out today. Gives a balanced view. Best Tony. I mean, totally different from the previous. This is one like, oh, if you get a chance, read this. Gives a balanced view. So the tone is different, but also that sentence, gives a balanced view. It's not true either. It's just not accurate. This article downplays, as I said, the lab leak theory emphasizes evolutionary cause to the virus. What happens next? What happens next? Later that same morning. Later that same morning at 11.47 a.m., Dr. Fauci's deputy gets back to him. I just want to read you this whole email. The paper you sent me, the one he sent him on that was written by the virologist from Wuhan, China, and Dr. Barrick. The paper you sent me says the experiments were performed before the gain-of-function pause but have since been re reviewed and approved by NIH. Not sure what that means since Emily, someone else who works for Dr. Fauci, is sure that no coronavirus work has gone through the P3 framework, which, of course, is the oversight body that's supposed to approve any grant dollars going for gain-of-function research. No coronavirus work has gone through the P3 framework. Final sentence, she will try to determine if we have any distant ties to this work abroad. She will try to determine if our fingerprints are on any of this. All these emails happen in 13 hours. 
So 13 hours after Dr. Fauci gets the initial email from Christian Anderson saying, looks like this virus is engineered, not consistent with evolutionary theory, Dr. Fauci knows some important facts. First, Dr. Fauci knows there's a lethal virus on the loose that started in Wuhan, China. Second, he knows the American taxpayers have funded gain-of-function research in Wuhan, China. Third, he knows that the research grant didn't go through the required oversight board. Fourth, he knows the virus, quote, looks engineered and, quote, not consistent with evolutionary theory. And finally, fifth, Dr. Fauci knows he may have ties to this work in China. His fingerprints, in fact, may be on this. So what does Dr. Fauci do next? After he says, oh, whatever, what does he do next? He organizes a conference call for later that same day. I mean, this is the busiest 24 hours I think I've ever seen. He organizes a conference call, 12 people on the call, Dr. Fauci and 11 virologists from around the world, virologists who've gotten millions of American tax dollars over the past several years. Now look at this list. Here's the list of people. There's only two Americans on the list, Tony Fauci and one other. Most of them are from around the world, as I said. I think the first thing you notice is who's not on the call. Who's not on the list? Is Dr. Cadlick on the list? The guy he sent the email to at three in the morning? Is Dr. Redfield the head of CDC? Dr. Girard, who's with us today, Assistant Secretary at HHS at the time? Dr. Burks, the lady who's soon to be COVID response coordinator? In fact, there's no one from the government on the call except Tony Fauci. Tony Fauci and 11 other individuals who got a bunch of American tax dollars over the years. What happened on the conference call? The short answer is we don't know. We don't know what they talked about. I mean, I, got a, I think we've got a good idea. We don't know for sure. But we do know what happened four days later. Four days later. Fe- now, before we move to four days later, it's important that we talk about February 1st. As of February 1st, for every single week in January, there were 4,000 plus people dying of PNI in the United States already. And Dr. Fauci had already been appearing on television, on uh, major mainstream network news, talking about this influenza season that he was in the midst of in January. And the fact that 4,000 people a week were dying in January, as these emails are arriving, Fauci knows full well what's been happening with influenza in Australia. He knows all about that. So as this is happening, the influenza outbreak is already underway. And Fauci has to know that. First, the deadly flu and the new and alarming numbers coming in from the CDC tonight. Among the worst flu season in a decade, and it hasn't peaked yet. 39 states now reporting high flu activity. Seven more children lost last week alone. 37 children dying so far this season. In today's morning rounds, this flu season is on track to be one of the worst in recent history. In terms of the number of people infected, flu is now widespread in almost every single state, and nearly 10 million people have become ill so far. 4,800 of those people have died. Pediatric deaths are double what they were this time last year, and Dr. Tara Narula is here to help us understand why. So, Health workers face a huge challenge trying to contain this season's flu outbreak. It is the most widespread in recent years, with at least 37 child deaths reported so far. The biggest clusters are in the South and West. Dr. Anthony Fauci is director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. He's part of the effort to fight future outbreaks. He joins us from the headquarters of the National Institutes of Health in Bethesda, Maryland. Dr. Fauci, good morning. Always good to see you. Take a look. You see all that red? I mean, how could you not? That should be a red flag about just how bad this year's flu season has gotten. The CDC says influenza is widespread in all but two states and Washington, D.C. It's that map, that rampant spreading virus we should be worried about. But in the last week, most of what we hear about when it comes to health news is the coronavirus. 
And we are in the midst of a terrible flu season. It is proving to be one for the record books. How can you prevent the flu from entering your home, your office, uh, your car? Joining me right now, Dr. Mikhail Varshavsky, or as we love to call him, Dr. Mike. Dr. Mike, good to see you. Good to see you. So first, give us the backdrop. I mean, so many people even canceled on our show. They have the flu. People that you friend. I mean, it's really bad this season. It's really bad, and I'm glad to hear that people are canceling on the show. Not because I don't want them to come on, right. but because I don't want them to spread the flu. That's a big problem. You see it even. Even in celebrity life, they'll go to the award shows, they'll get on stage, claim their award, and say, oh, by the way, I have the flu. And then 15 minutes After later, hugging they're kissing hugging everybody. and they're kissing everybody, and signing touching autographs. The mic, and somebody else touches the mic. But that's attention-seeking behavior, is it not? Because if they had this real flu, they wouldn't be able to stand yeah. up on a stage. Well, yeah, you're right. I mean, the flu right? affects people differently, so I don't want to make judgments there too early. But I will say, if they do have the flu, horrible, horrible, horrible to go outside and spread it to people, you have to stay home. Because the flu spreads through contact, through breathing. In fact, a lot of people think, oh, if I sneeze in a room, that means it, it can get to somebody six feet away. No, get this. You can sneeze in an empty room. Someone can walk in an hour later, and your flu germs are still hanging out in the air. So, an hour later? Yes. So, Dr. Mike, is, there, is this flu season worse than other flu seasons? And is it because this strain is not being treated by the flu vaccine? And if yes, how do we fix that going forward? So, great question. We don't have a perfect answer to it because we get a lot of the statistics of the flu that we have right now after the season has concluded. What we do know, this peak is an incredibly high peak. It came early and it's lasting an extra long time. So, we have record number of hospitalizations, record number of pediatric deaths, and all of this is coming earlier on in the flu season than we usually what, expect to what's see. What's so it. devastating about this flu? Is it the gastrointestinal distress? Is it the fever that is causing the most uh, health risk? Well, the, the way that I like to explain it is it's not the flu that really takes you down. It's the complications from the flu that mm. takes you down. Right. Think about your immune system as being an army and it's fighting this infection and it's going to fight off the infection. That's not really the worrisome if you have an intact immune system. The worry is that in the midst of having this battle, the battlefield, aka your respiratory tract, your nose, your throat, your lungs, it gets damaged through inflammation. And that can lead to bronchitis, pneumonia, and those are the serious illnesses that actually claim your life. Yeah, these are these are different, uh, you know, things that you're getting with the flu versus a common cold. I mean, exactly. this is very different. Dr. Mike, great stuff. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Dr. Mike, joining us there. Came from uh, Dr. Oshinkloss. As back to Dr. Fauci. Dr. Oshinkloss, again, just, just to refresh, is is... Dr. Fauci's top deputy. So this is the email on Saturday, February 1st at 11.47 in the morning. It's in response to the one that Dr. Fauci sent in the middle of the night saying, hey, we got important things. I got to talk to you. Keep your phone on. You're going to have tasks to do, et cetera. So he gets back to him. Uh, the email says, the paper you sent me says the experiments were performed. The, the, again, the paper is about gain-of-function research in, at the Wuhan lab uh, uh, before the gain-of-function pause, but have since been reviewed and approved by NIH. Not sure what that means, since Emily is sure that no coronavirus work has gone through the P3 framework. She will determine if we have any to sanitize this work abroad. Uh, Dr. Girard, are you part of the when you were in the government? Were you part of the P3 framework? Uh, I was not. How it does the P3 framework? It's uh, my understanding. It's an oversight board that is there to. Uh, to decide if you are, in fact, going to fund any gain-of-function research. Is that right? Um, that's what the intent is, but how it works, how, how uh, research gets in, taken into that, it's unbelievable to me that coronavirus work would not get even into the process. If you look at the abstract from the latest grant yeah. that was done to EcoHealth, it talks about using protein sequence data, infectious clone technology, in vitro and in vivo um, infection experiments. This is all gain of function. How right. this could not get into the P3 process is unbelievable. And once it does, how does it work? So let's, on it. How do you judge? Let's just back up for a second. I should have done this. I should have done this earlier. Uh, there was a pause in any gain of function research. And my understanding was the pause was in 2014. And so for a few years, Correct. we didn't fund any of it. Right. I don't know why we're been, I mean, I think there's a fundamental question if we should be funding it at all, but we were funding it pause 2014 was restarted a few years later, and but under the uh, the premise that if we're going to restart it, we're going to set up this P3 framework, this oversight body, this oversight function that people will have to look at this closely or a second look or whatever, some oversight look before it gets uh, funded. Who determines now in the P3 framework during this time, so uh, when it was restarted, 
who determines what goes in front of the P3 framework or the P3 board? Who makes that determination? Um, I am sorry, I don't know that. And I don't think anybody knows that <laughs> about uh, uh, out of the hundreds or thousands of grants, who picks which ones go and not. And if there were truly no coronavirus work that got there, you have an intake problem. That means dozens, hundreds of- Well, someone's got to be responsible. Who, 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 heads, who heads NIH? Well, you know, ultimately the buck stops with Dr. Collins, who's the NIH director. And Dr. Stops, Fauci, he makes decisions on the- Dr. Fauci on NIAID. They are the directors. Um, ultimately, they are the responsible individuals. So in the end, the people responsible for this, who are supposed to decide if, if, if a grant proposal is going to go in front of the P3 framework board process or not, is ultimately Dr. Collins and Dr. Fauci. Is that right? They run the institutes, they run the NIH, the buck stops there. Yeah. That's correct. Okay. I think, Dr. Quay, you were getting ready to say something? Uh, well, yes. The, the, mor the moratorium started in 2014. It, it, uh, it was taken away in May 2017. And as far as I know, there's never been a grant that's gone before this, this structure the, the B3, despite the fact it was set up. So it was set up to look for gain-of-function research, and I, my understanding is that there's been no grant that's been sent. Well, my understanding is the guy who heads the, 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 the chair of this, of this board, this P3 uh, framework board, is Dr. Hassel. And he's even, he's even said in a, in a public forum, he volunteered this information, that he's the chair, and he said it's been very limited, the work that they've done. Very few proposals come in front of them. But, but I think maybe the, the big takeaway for us today is the people responsible for making these decisions, Dr. Collins, Dr. Fauci, we invited him, they wouldn't come. And then the guy who chairs the board, Dr. Hassel, we invited him and he wouldn't come. I think there's, I think there's, there's uh, something there. Um, do, you, do you think, well, let, let, me, let me do this question first. Dr. Muller, you, you raised something. Um, well, let me go back. Dr. Girard, why don't you think they're here? Why wouldn't they come? Dr. Fauci and Dr. Collins and Mr. Hassel. Um, you know, I don't know. I know Tony and I, I know Francis, uh, pretty well. Um, I, I can't imagine a reason because this is a worldwide pandemic in which millions of people have died. Um, it may have been a result of a lab leak. There will be other, and we think highly likely it is, there will be other pandemics in the future. And if there's something we need, not just Congress, and I know you need it, but the American people in the world needs it is truth and transparency and openness and trust. And when public officials who are supposed to have our trust don't show up to members of Congress, I think that's a problem. He I'm, showed up everywhere for a year and a half. I mean, you couldn't go, you couldn't go a day. You couldn't go a day and not see Dr. Fauci somewhere. He was everywhere. I mean, he was like, He's like man of the millennial or whatever time de declared him. I mean, he was everywhere. And now, now when we have emails that he's sending out at 12 and two in the morning and we have this gain of function that didn't go through the process it's supposed to go through and we have all this, this evidence, suddenly you can't find him. Well, you know, all those redacted emails, they're redacted to you and to me, but they're not redacted to the people who are on it. So he could read it unredacted and refresh his memory and inform Congress. And look, sure um, could. when I was in the Trump administration, I got pinged by many antagonistic members on the House or the Senate side. 100% uh, of time, I answered questions. I came to everything because I felt it was my duty as a public servant we appreciate that. to try to be open to everyone. And you know that. Yeah, this I've is not the first time you've times. testified. So you've I would testified encourage many times. We appreciate my that. former colleagues uh, to be open and transparent and provide that type of honesty, transparency, and trust to the American people. If okay, I, I want to go one. If, if the chairman will indulge, I want to do one more to Mr. Gerard. Then I do want to come to you, Dr. Dr. Mueller. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Uh, Gerard, uh, Admiral, in your um, in your testimony, written testimony in Perspective Four. You said this, investigation of the origins of COVID-19 and the regulation of gain-of-function research cannot be left to scientists alone, many of whom have serious conflicts of interest. I think that is obvious. I mean, I, that, that's in the four emails I showed that took place in a 13-hour time span. I think that is clear just from those four emails, the, the, the conflicts of interest. But I wanted to give you a little chance to, to expound on that and expand on that um, if you could. So I just thought it needed to be said. Um, I have the highest respect for scientists and physicians and 
for people who have uh, developed so many things that are saving lives and curing disease. But scientists are like everybody else. They're people. They have conflicts of interest, and we should be very open about that, that uh, we sort of have a little quote that we can't hide behind our white coats of self-righteousness, that we have hundreds of thousands of dollars in salaries and millions of dollars at stake. And this needs to be, this in, in reputations, I think is very, very important among an anti, generally anti-Republican scientific community. Let me, let me, so these need to be explicitly talked about. If I could just do one follow-up to that. Were, does it concern you that, that that conference call I referenced in my opening statement, that, that conference call that w between, there was only one person from our government on there and all these others were scientists who were getting our tax, American taxpayers' uh, money. Does that concern you, that call, the way that that took place? Um, it, it, it's not sort of a smoking gun concern to me, but what would be a concern to me is that wasn't specifically related to Dr. Cadillac or the secretary of HHS or anybody on the table Or to you. Immediately, or, or to me. Um, you know, that really should have been done. This was very important. And, it, you know, we say that it doesn't matter whether it was in the lab or not, but that's not necessarily true. If we would have known it were a lab-derived uh, uh, bug uh, for which they probably had years of work, it might have appreciably helped our countermeasures, uh, uh, how we go about uh, understanding sure. whether it could be asymptomatic or not. So this was critical. Um, and I think that email, all that blacked out spots needs to be, maybe we don't need to know it, but Congress needs to know it and understand Sure it. do, sure do. Okay, finally, if I could, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your indulgence. Uh, Dr. Moeller, in your in the, uh, the close of your opening uh, statement, you said that people were afraid. You talked to people in the research community, in your community, who were afraid to be doing any research that might expose that the truth that this came from a lab, because they were concerned about getting blackballed from China. Is that right? You said something to that effect. That, that's pretty close. I, I'm not sure that they were convinced that they didn't. Want so this is pretty interesting how the scientific community was reluctant to take a particular position because of political affiliation or the perception of political affiliation. Uh, so listen to this. This is uh, fascinating. To be involved in that kind of investigation, what, what, whether how that investigation would turn out, they, they weren't sure. But yes, uh, there were other reasons, too. When I... When people learned I was going to come here, uh, I live in Berkeley. I get lots of advice. <laughs> I get advice not only from my friends and colleagues in Berkeley, but I get advice from all around the country. Yeah. Uh, not one person of all my friends and advisors uh, thought I should come to this committee. So uh, the reason was because it was Republicans. My response to every one of them is I am not going to go and – you know, scientists, yes, they are often biased. You need to distinguish between scientists' opinions and science. And science is nonpartisan. Science is unbiased. Uh, I came here and I told all them I was going to come here and I will talk to anybody. Yeah. And I want to present science because I think in this case, the science by itself carries the argument. I, I, I don't want you to ask me for my opinions on right. things. I, I, if I this is exactly how I feel. I don't want to share my opinions. I want to share the facts. I want to share the data. I want to share the evidence that I found. And you draw your own opinions and your own conclusions. My opinion and my conclusions are somewhat irrelevant. What matters is the evidence and the fact that I'm able to find it and present it. And what this doctor is saying, I really respect, which is, you know, the science is the data, the math, uh, it, it doesn't have a political affiliation, and none of my investigations do either. They're purely based on evidence, not whether it's Democrats or Republicans in the White House. You know, n neither of them have been sending me a check. So, you know, I, I, I don't get a gift from either one of the parties. If I stick to the science, then I can defend myself against the, the well, my, my friends. The, the chairman just refreshed my memory. Uh, he said the words you used were enemies of China, I think you used, when anyone who would be doing research that would go against the evolutionary theory of this was, was going to be somehow attacked. But it wasn't just China. This is my point. It was everyone. Dr. Fauci was against doing that. The media was against. big. If you did that, big tech went against. Everyone went against the people who were actually, as it turns out, you know, focusing on the truth, 
that is a that is a scary thing for our country. And it goes right to your point. That's about opinions and politics, not about science. And that is what has happened, what did happen for the last year and a half. And my point that I made in my opening statement was, and Dr. Fauci, I believe, based on what I showed you all, I believe knew that from the get-go and was misleading the American people. And again, maybe I'm wrong, but he could have came here and answered my questions. Uh, another quick anecdote. In September, when I called a virologist at a national laboratory and said, uh, I, need, I, I, I was soliciting some help. This was before I met Dr. Quay. I was soliciting some help on this issue. Uh, he said, uh, no, I'm, I'm not going to touch that. I'm not going to recommend anybody touch that because it would help the reelection of Donald Trump. Yep. So it was a, all it was a, it was a political issue for some of them. Yeah. Well, thank you, Dr. Thanks. Mueller. Again, thank you for and all of you. All right, so that was from the Jim Jordan, Steve Scalise Republican investigation into the origins of coronavirus. Uh, what I want to show you now is something that Dan Bongino published about a month ago. And he was digging into one or two of these emails, and he's making some connections here that I want you guys to see. So uh, let me just resize this so that you can see it properly. Now that we have the setup... <laughs> looking at the clock because I want to make sure I summed it up in 10 minutes, which is good. 10 minutes. Now we have to ask the question, well, what are they covering up? Why are they making reports disappear? Why are death threats being issued? I'm going to ask you a question that's probably going to get me in trouble, but it's, it's the good kind of trouble. Because I've always asked questions about Spygate and other things that have gotten me in trouble only to later be vindicated. I watched Maura Eliason on Fox News last night on Brett Baer's show, who is a, you know, pretty pronounced leftist. I think it's obvious and, you know, always toes the leftist company line. And now Maura Eliason's like, well, you know, maybe we should have looked at that lab leak hypothesis. But, you know, these other theories about a bioweapon, oh, they're crazy. Here we are back to the, you're a conspiracy theorist again. The minute Maura Eliason said that, I remembered an email I got a few days ago, and I said, here we go. Leftists at it again. Instead of entertaining an idea, calling it a conspiracy theory from the start, and that's why, of course, leftists will jump all over this segment now, but that's great. As long as they put the link to the show, I'm very happy. Here's the question. What are they covering up? Did we finance a bioweapon from China? Oh, the verdict is in, folks. Leftists are they're clawing at their faces, we're pulling hair out, claw, salivating at the oh, but you know, conspiracy. Theory. Oh, my conspiracy. Theory. You can't say that. Oh, they face claw, salivating at the mouth, foam, foam everywhere, foam all over the place. Because leftists are generally dunce imbeciles. And anytime you ask a question that makes them uncomfortable, of course, they go into a panic and call it conspiracy theories. Are they covering up the fact that we may, I repeat, may have financed a Chinese bioweapon with gain of function research money that was paid out after the government prohibited gain of function research money? Watching the leftists go crazy over the idea that this may have been a bioweapon says to me, it, it, the effect is unintentional, I'm sure, you know. The, the, the intentional effect of the left by calling everyone wackos and conspiracy theorists who actually ask this question about a bioweapon is to shut us up. But the, what really happens is I talk about it more because the leftist telling us to shut up makes me believe there could, could be something there. Am I tell, let me be clear on this because I believe in facts on the show. Am I telling you this is a Chinese bioweapon, COVID-19? No, that's not what I'm telling you. Am I telling you it could be? Oh, yeah. Did we finance a bioweapon from China that wiped out millions of people? With All right, so what, what Dan is doing is being a little bit overly simplistic here. And what Dan is not taking into consideration is something we call the Lays phenomenon. And the Lays phenomenon is something that uh, the Lays potato chip manufacturing company realized very early, which is that you can't have just one. And so what Dan needs to understand is that 
these guys didn't finance one lab and one gain of function project with one virus. They've been funding it with multiple labs and multiple uh, experiments with multiple viruses in multiple locations around the world because that's what they do. And so the gain of function on SARS-CoV-2 is somewhat uninteresting compared to gain of function work that might be going on on even deadlier viruses. So for example, is there gain of function going on on Lassa virus? Is there gain of function going on on Marburg virus? And if so, who's doing it and where? So all the talk about Peter Daszak and uh, Dr. Xi in Wuhan, the Batwoman and all that, is drawing all the attention to a particular virus and a particular laboratory where 5,000 people haven't died. Meaning there's more people dead in Maryland than in China. So all this obsession about Wuhan and Daszak and SARS-CoV-2 virus and gain-of-function work on that virus seems to me to be a distraction from the work of doctors like Dr. Yoshihiro Kawaoka that's been doing gain-of-function on Spanish flu H1N1 since 2004. So when we look at that type of work, that to me seems more deadly. But let's continue listening to what Dan has to say, because he's going to get into uh, one or two of these emails, and it's pretty interesting here. Our taxpayer dollars. Ooh. Oh, digest that one a minute. I'd like to say it's scandal of the century, but after Spygate, I'm, and what could come next, I'm hesitant to give out that gold medal right away in the scandal Olympic. I appreciate the, with what could come next. So the fact that Dan's been talking about Taubenberger and he keeps calling him Tautenberger uh, is sort of Dan's plausible deniability that he's not watching the show, but we see you, Dan, and we love you. Keep going. You're doing a great job. Here we go. Did we finance a bioweapon with U.S. taxpayer dollars that killed millions of people and escaped from the lab? Fauci's panicking about this one, too. Fauci gave a media, a media appearance the other day and was like, what do you think? The Chinese built a bioweapon to kill millions of their citizens and Americans? Uh, no, Doc, I don't believe they leaked it on purpose. That's why it's called a leak. But it's interesting that Fauci would say that would kill millions of their citizens, but that's not what happened. Again, there's fewer people dead in China than in Maryland. There aren't 5,000 people dead in China. So when Fauci says something like that, he's using a spin that doesn't incorporate facts. According to the WHO, according to the CDC, according to Johns Hopkins, there are not 5,000 people dead in China. So Fauci's response is hyperbolic. It's, he's just throwing numbers around that have nothing to do with the facts. But here's Admiral Brett Garrar on, I believe, with Bill Hemmer on the Fox News Channel. And listen, Brett Garrar, who is, was intimately involved with the whole coronavirus task force under the Trump administration, he's been very outspoken lately. Um, and Brett Garrar was on Bill Hemmer, and here Brett Garrar just goes for it. Check this one out. It is not outrageous to hypothesize, you say, that the virus could have been part of an offensive bioweapons program and leaked out accidentally. Um, sure, that, that seems to be discount. Well, uh, that seems to be discounted by Dr. Collins and other people. I think the most likely uh, explanation is that it was gain of function mutation work. It leaked out. But uh, unlike the United States, the United States does not have an offensive biological weapons program. There are multiple open sources of, of intel that suggest that China has an extensive biological weapons program and that it's integrated between state laboratories, academia, and private industry. So it is not crazy, as people uh, suggest, uh, like Dr. Collins suggested, that this could have been part of a bio program. That was you think he's just throwing that out there because he's got nothing to do on the Bill Hemmer program? He's bored, twiddling his thumbs. He's like, let me make something. Oh, you know what? Bioweb. Yeah, that's right. That sounds good. You think he's eager for, like, 
Twitter retweets and sound bites like he cares about that? Folks, this, again, I'm telling you this, understanding Spygate, the impeachment hoax, these mega scandals we've lived through in just the last five, six years. I'm telling you this one. This one is, is, this is it. I mean, this is potentially the gold, the, the platinum medal winner of scandals, if this turns out to be true. And, and seriously, to the... And again, he's simply discovering a cover-up virus. He still doesn't understand what was killing 4,000 people in January every week. So until Dan acknowledges that and the gain of function done on that virus and the accidental escape of that virus, even though Fauci predicted a surprise outbreak, it would be hard to believe that uh, Dr. Fauci would do something like this on purpose, even though he predicted it. So if we give him the benefit of the doubt and we assume that the H1N1 outbreak was accidental, uh, not mentioning it, not bringing it up after his appearances in main, uh, mainstream media in January, where he does mention Tamiflu once or twice, but then that was it. And then as soon as this coronavirus arrived, all the attention went there, and no one mentioned influenza uh, again until I put my paper together in October of 2020 that said that it's been eradicated from the planet. So... Um, I think Dan is figuring it out, uh, but the depth of it um, and just how heinous it is and the, the, the breadth of the cover-up, I don't think he understands that yet. But let's continue. Leftists who are obsessed with my show, the more you call this a conspiracy theory, the more I will double down. You've been warned. I don't care if ScrewTube bans us or Fakebook. I have Rumble. I have Parler. I have other outlets. I, I, I don't care. This may be the most important story of our lifetime. And your attacks will only enrage me further to talk about it more. You've been warned. I'm just putting it out there. You think Garar's, you think Garar's just going on Bill Hemmer and throwing that out there because he doesn't know anything? He was only a key member of the task force who obviously has access to top secret information about the coronavirus program. And he makes a pretty key point that, yes, the Chinese government, we have multiple intelligence sources, as, as, which have outed repeatedly the Chinese government's active bioweapons creation program. Wouldn't that really be bizarre if our taxpayer dollars somehow assisted a bioweapons program? Now, let's go back to the beginning here. I, I kind of put the bottom line up front. Now we're going to start to build the case a little more that somebody's hiding something and it's clear that there's probably a law enforcement investigation going on right now. And again, the question is, what the hell did U.S. taxpayers pay for and did somebody try to make it go away? The investigation, that is. Dr. Redfield used to head the CDC. Dr. Redfield opened up Pandora's box back in March. I don't know if you remember this, but he was talking to Sanjay Gupta from CNN. He gave an interview back in March when the lab leak hypothesis was still considered by media buffoons, was still considered to be a conspiracy theory. Remember that? Back then, if you said it, you'd be banned from Twitter. We said it anyway, so did many others. Um, I don't really care what they say. But seriously, just back in March, what are we in now? I'm losing track of time. June, not that long ago, this was still considered a nutty conspiracy theory. This was the moment, though, Pandora's box was open and the so-called media serious people, what we would call the buffoons in the mainstream media, but they consider themselves seriously, had to start to pay attention. This was a key interview. Check this out. If I was to guess this virus started transmitting somewhere in September, October in Wuhan. September, October. That's my own view. It's an only opinion. I'm allowed to have opinions now. You know, I am of the point of view that I still think the most likely uh, etiology of this pathogen in Wuhan was a, from a laboratory 
um, you know, escaped. Uh, the other people don't believe that. That's fine. Science will eventually figure it out. It's not unusual for respiratory pathogens that are being worked on in a laboratory to infect the laboratory worker. Kind of odd, no, that former Trump officials in the Trump administration, both Redfield and Garrar, who, again, had access to top secret information and were involved with the coronavirus task force with President Donald Trump, once President Trump left office, felt the freedom to speak out. One of them says um, he's at this point believes it could be a lab leak. And the other one says, hey, we should pay attention to their bioweapons program. You think that's a big coinky dink? Now, as I said just a few minutes ago, you can always tell you're over a target gauging the response by the leftists and the degree of the freak out. So after Redfield went out and spoke about that, you'll notice that we just found out from the Epic Times, and you'll see this headline, former CDC director Redfield received death threats from scientists for supporting Wuhan lab leak theory. Ladies and gentlemen, someone was panicking. Redfield was talking about a lab leak. Garar's now talking about the possibility of a bioweapon. We now know from the Daily Caller report, our money was indirectly used to fund this kind of stuff. You see why the panic's ensuing now? No, the panic is ensuing because... Dan Bongino keeps mentioning Jeffrey Taubenberger and because Jon Stewart goes on the Colbert show and says, we went to Alaska and we dug these guys up. And because Maria Bartiromo says, we wouldn't have had an emergency use authorization for Pfizer and Moderna if we had an effective therapeutic. That's why they're scared. It's the combination of all of these people starting to become aware of what's happening. And so when Dan keeps mentioning Taubenberger, even when he calls him Taubenberger, that's what's got Fauci scared. He knows that we know that this isn't about gain of function on SARS-CoV-2. This is about gain of function on the deadliest virus on the planet. And that's not Ebola. Let's continue. And that leads to part two of this, where we'll get to, is there a criminal investigation going on right now? Was there a pressure campaign to shut people up who wanted to talk about this? Everybody starts panicking. So now let's get to this part two. I said, is there a criminal investigation? What's my evidence here? Again, please go check out the Twitter thread. I retweeted by Dawson S. Field. It's quite interesting. A lot of this stuff will be in there. I'm going to combine it with some stuff I got from someone else as well. So what makes me think there's a criminal investigation into efforts to make this cover-up go away, to cover up the cover-up of the lab leak hypothesis? Well, here's an interesting email that came out in the Fauci emails. You saw some of it the other day. It's an email from a guy by the name of Peter Daszak, who conveniently works with the EcoHealth Alliance I discussed earlier. You see why I did this in order? EcoHealth Alliance is that entity that got your taxpayer dollars and was working with the Wuhan Institute of Virology. Peter Daszak worked there. Peter Daszak, conveniently, I want you to pay very close attention to the date, April 18th, emails Dr. Anthony Fauci. Pay very close attention to the date, April 18th, 2020. Peter Daszak, Anthony Fauci. He's emailing someone in Fauci's office and CCing him saying, hey, listen, I really basically want to thank you guys for your comments talking about Fauci. He says, quote, from my perspective, your comments are brave and coming from your trusted voice will help dispel the myths being spun around the virus origins. He says, once this is over, I look forward to thanking you in person and letting you know how important your comments are to all of us. So the guy who works with the entity who got taxpayer dollars And then indirectly, we use them to fund the uh, Wuhan Institute of Virology. Is sending Fauci a thank you on April 18th, 2020? What is he thanking Fauci for? Well, here's April 17th, 2020, the day before Dashak thanks Fauci. And here's what Fauci said 
the day before. Check this out. There was a study uh, recently that we can make available to you where a, a group of highly qualified evolutionary virologists looked at the sequences there and the sequences in uh, bats as they evolve. And the mutations that it took to get to the point where it is now is totally consistent with a jump of a species from an animal to a human. So, I mean, the, the paper will be available. I, I don't have the authors right now, but we can make that available too. So there was a paper? So Fauci says on April 17th, hey, <laughs> you press, press, Borg members of the press. So, you know, the Borg, they think with a collective mind. I don't even watch Star Trek. Someone just told me about the Borg. But I've heard they think with a collective hive mind. So Borg members of the press, don't worry. There's a paper coming out. And this paper is going to be pretty clear that don't worry, it wasn't a lab leak. This was an evolutionary process. Jump from a pangolin or bat or whatever to a human being. No worries, folks. And weird, the next day, Peter Daszak sends an email. Thank him. Guy, can we go back to that Daszak email? We before, before, sorry, I don't mean to go out of order, but it's important. Scroll down a little bit. There's a redaction there on the email highlighted. That highlight, again, hat tip Dawson Field, because I always like to give appropriate credit. There's part of it that's redacted. The email from Peter Daszak the day after Fauci's comments saying, hey, there's a paper out there saying this is all BS. Don't worry about it. The redaction is interesting because it's redacted. We'd like to know what it says. But the redaction is even more interesting because if you look at the highlight, it's redacted because of B7A. What is B7A? That gives the reason for the redaction. <laughs> you ready? Get a load of this one. That's the code for if we put this out there, it would interfere with an active law enforcement proceeding. Oh, oh, really? Really? Nice one, Dan. Hmm. Press house Java there. An active law enforcement proceeding. Well, you may say to yourself, is Fauci under investigation? I mean, it was a Fauci FOIA. I'm not sure. I, I doubt it because as Dawson points out in the thread, you can read it yourself and you should. Well, nothing else is really, I mean, not, nothing. I shouldn't say nothing else. There's very little redacted in some of the other emails too, meaning that's kind of odd. If they were investigating Fauci, you'd think there'd be more redaction. So I, I don't know is the answer to that. But what I do know is this. There is some law enforcement proceeding going on, and they redacted portions of Dashak's email. Who could they be investigating? And remember that Fauci presser, where he talks about this paper that says, don't worry, it's all natural. Well, here's another email from one of Fauci's deputies, Greg Folkers. And I want you to pay very close attention to the date, and it may explain where the panic started internally. The panic started externally when Redfield gave that interview in March to uh, Sanjay Gupta. But internally, the panic broke out at a different time. Put up that email. Here's an email from Greg Folkers, one of Fauci's deputies at NIH. You can see it's obviously his official government email. He sent it Friday, January 31st, 2020. It's a paper. It says, mining coronavirus genomes for clues to origins outbreak. They were asking a lot of questions in this paper. Questions people didn't want asked. Like, hey, is this, uh, you know, could this thing possibly be from lab or else? Where did this thing come from? So Fauci's deputy back in January, before that April 17th conference, seems a little bit concerned about where the origins are, and other people appeared very concerned too. Hmm. Back in January. Maybe Dashak and them started a panic right around then. Why are people asking questions about where this came from? Because it's only one of the biggest questions of our time. Here's a weird email, though. Here's the next one. Weird, because you don't see Fauci's email anywhere on it. 
Yet the FOIA request, Freedom of Information Act, for Fauci's emails was for Fauci's emails. But if you'll notice, you don't really see Fauci's email anywhere. Is it redacted? This is a strange email. Because that same guy, Greg Folkers, who in January... So the answer is yes. Fauci's email is most likely redacted from this. Because if they asked for all of Fauci's emails, uh, there, there's no reason this would be in the group unless it was from Anthony Fauci, but that is redacted. So the from at the top of the email is gone. Uh, it's to Greg Folkers, but the subject is the Morins, Daszak, and Taubenberger paper. Now, what's interesting, the videos that I've done before have featured David Morins and Jeffrey Taubenberger. So the two people that uh, none of the attention is going to are the people that have been working with this stuff for the longest. Peter Daszak doesn't work for the NIH. Taubenberger and David Morins do. So putting all the attention on the guy who does not work for the U.S. government probably makes sense. So that means we want to talk about David Morins and Jeffrey Taubenberger, not Peter Daszak. Was uh, a recipient of this paper article wondering about the origins of this. Same guy's on it, Greg Folkers, Fauci, Fauci's deputy. And you notice he's warning about being a co-author on a paper? He's saying, I agree, I will not be a co-author. There's this paper they want someone in Fauci's office to be a co-author on. Is that the same paper he was talking about April 17th? Well, here's a question for you. Is this the paper? Here's the next element here. From this, uh, what is it, New Jersey, uh, uh, excuse me, the uh, jur some journal of medicine. Is this the paper that they wanted him to be a co-author on? <laughs> New England Journal of Medicine. Escaping Pandora's Box, another novel coronavirus. Oh. <laughs> now, this is a document that we've been featuring here on the show that was published by David Morins and Jeffrey Taubenberger and Peter Daszak. But again, Peter Daszak is not an employee of the U.S. government, whereas David Morins and Jeffrey Taubenberger are. So, of course... Making Peter Daszak the scapegoat would make sense, as he's not a U.S. government employee. Jeffrey Taubenberger, on the other hand, is the one who reconstructed the H1N1 uh, pandemic influenza, the only BSL-4 influenza on Earth. He's the one who reconstructed that, and now that's in BSL-4 labs around the world because the genome was published on GenBank publicly. So this document, this, um, this paper that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine in February of 2020, that was offered, authored by Taubenberger and Morins, is, is key. And the fact that Dan Bongino is picking up on this is also great, because all these roads are leading to Taubenberger. <laughs> Look at the authors, ladies and gentlemen. Taubenberger, MD, PhD. Peter Daszak, Ph.D., and David Morins. Well, what did they say in this paper in the New England Journal of Medicine? Let's go to the next part of this. This is just really fascinating. It says, of course, scientists tell us SARS-CoV did not escape from a jar. RNA sequences closely resemble those of viruses that silent cir silently circulate in bats. And ep epidemiological information implicates a bat origin virus infecting unidentified animal species sold in China's live animal markets. So really weird how Peter Daszak and this guy Tautenberger are authors on this paper. Fascinating. Uh, this paper says, no worries, folks. Don't you worry. Looks like it just came from a bat market thing, live animal markets. So the fact that Dan keeps referring to him as Taubenberger, I find entertaining. So it's not the first time he refers to Jeffrey Taubenberger as Taubenberger. And uh, it, it's a little bit of a tell 
on the part of Boncino, but uh, again, I like what Dan is doing and I like where he's going. So let's continue. Nobody worry. Lab leak, schmab leak. No worries. Is that the paper? Is that the paper they want someone? Lab leak, schmab leak. Is that what he just said? Didn't I just publish a video called Wuhan Schmuhan with Jason? Our authors on this paper, fascinating. Uh, this paper says, no worries, folks. Don't you worry. Looks like it just came from a bat market thing, live animal markets. Nobody worry. Lab leak, schmab leak. No worries. Is that the paper? Is that the paper they want someone from Fauci's office to be a co-author on? Is that the paper Fauci citing in this April 17th presser where he says, media people, don't worry. There's a paper that says... This is evolutionary. No lab leak at all. And is that the paper the next day? Dashak, one of the authors of the paper, is thanking Fauci basically for his comments on an email that's been redacted because of an ongoing criminal investigation, law enforcement investigation. Very good stuff, Dan. Very good. Ladies and gentlemen, what's redacted there? What's redacted there? Let's go back to Fauci again. Here's Fauci again. I'm going to play this again. Talking about this paper and giving basically marching orders to the press to never speak of the lab leak hypothesis again because Fauci was their messiah. Listen now again. The paper's been out there. He knows about the paper. Dashak's one of the authors of the paper with this guy, Tautenberger. Tautenberg, whatever his name is. And Fauci knows what it says. And Dashak appears to have a very good reason here for not wanting to talk about lab leaks. Check it out. There was a study uh, recently that we can make available to you where a, a group of highly qualified evolutionary virologists looked at the sequences there and the sequences in uh, bats as they evolve. And the mutations that it took to get to the point where it is now is totally consistent with a jump of a species from an animal to a human. So, I mean, the, the paper will be available. I, I don't have the authors right now, but we can make that available too. Was that Dashak's paper that he thanked him about the next day? And why was Dashak, again, so eager to make all this go away? All right, so I think Dan had a, a number of really good observations there. What I want to go to now is um, a, a, a clip back to Dr. Gerard with um, Jim Jordan. Let me cue this up for you guys. It's pretty cheap, pretty effective, and I'm more worried now, not just about China, but about every terrorist crackpot that I've dealt with in the world over the last 30 years coming out of the shadows and trying to get a hold of U.S. technology to program these things on bioreactors on a desktop. So, so if, I'm, if I may to just, um, I spent much of my career in biological warfare defense, both at DARPA and at DITRA, at the Threat Reduction Advisory Committee. And I want to just emphasize that I agree with everything Dr. Asher said, export controls. But I do want to raise another dirty little secret that really needs to be looked at by Congress and that those export controls should also include Americans' DNA sequences. Um, this is a really vital piece uh, in general. Even the NIH often exports gene sequencing for many of our people to China. Uh, China absolutely keeps databases on what in our genes, what are our susceptibilities, is there a possibility of ethnic weapons. However, China does not allow any sequences of Chinese out of their country. There's a reason for that. So uh, again, I don't want to steal your thunder, Dr. Asher, but uh, it's not just technology, but it's information, and genetic information is really critical. And the last thing, uh, you, Dr. Green, just sorry to interrupt, but the, the one area you didn't mention, which is the scariest, not that you didn't read it. I mean, it's just, it's so terrifying, I can't even process it. The, in the Chinese Declaration of 2011, they talked about, to the Biological Weapons Convention, they talked about systems biology further revealing population-specific genetic markers. They can yield an improvement in levels of human health, but also can create the potential for biological weapons based on genetic differences between races. 
Once hostile elements grasp the different be- difference between a- 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 different ethnic groups harbor I- intrinsically different genetic susceptibilities, particular pathogens, they can put that knowledge into practice and create genetic weapons targeted at a racial group with a particular susceptibility. I am certainly not a racist, but uh, and I've spent my life in Asia. But to hear the Chinese communists talk about ethno-targeting to the Biological Weapons Convention is pretty scary. Thank you. Um, well, I, I think that's what I wanted you to hear. So uh, I believe that was 2011 that he was talking about. So that was 10 years ago. Um, and that was a, from a Chinese presentation. So um, some interesting information here all around from Jim Jordan and the uh, investigation that they were putting together to look into this when Admiral Girard shows up along with Dr. Mueller and some of these other guys, and then some of the investigative work that Dan Bongino was doing, uh, it, it appears that more was known about potentially um, covering something up. You know, who, who knows? So we don't make any claims and we don't make any allegations. So we're just watching what happened in Congress and listening to what Dan Bongino had to say and sharing our input. Hypothetically speaking, I'm John Cohen. Thanks for joining.